So this is really perfect timing for both sides, I think, which is of course the ideal case. Um, and I'm really looking forward not only to the presentation as such, but also in particular to the discussion and to sort of uh, perhaps also interpreting our first results together with you um, and contextualizing these um, in a sort of broader framework of what we know about dynamics of forced migration. Uh, not only, I would say, with a view to Europe, but also um, origin countries in the Middle East, for instance. Um, one of our previous surveys focused very much on the 2015 cohort of refugees. And again, this notion of self-selection, which um, in migration research is mainly, uh, has mainly so far been related to regular migration. So regular migrants have always been known for being highly self-selected. But now I think there is increasing evidence, and this is one more puzzle piece, that shows that also forced migrants um, display this degree of self-selection in key dimensions like education, that was already mentioned, but also socioeconomic background and so on. And so I will present the survey as such. I will also present, and I hope that's interesting to you also, a bit of insights into our field phase, because this was a rapid response survey in a highly, I would even say almost emergency situation, a high stakes environment. So give you also a bit of methodological insights um, also, I would say with regards to research ethics that are necessarily involved in such a context. And then, of course, we move also to the comparison with our sister survey uh, that was done in Krakow in Poland, uh, where we do see some slight differences with regards to the socio-demographic composition of the Ukrainian displaced population there compared to the Venus one. So, but let me start by saying that this is, of course, not a single uh, single woman's show, but really it's a joint project. I'm also really happy that I'm joined by my colleague Bernhard Rings today, who uh, very kindly offered also to be available for the discussion later on. Uh, he really is uh, also very much the data and methodological mastermind in the background. So any questions concerning sampling <laughs> data and so on should really be directed to him. So I'm really glad that he's here. And this is really a larger team. This is only the Austrian team, by the way. So the Polish team, again, has as many people. Um, so this is, you of course need a lot of human resources to do this in such a short time. Um, and we were particularly thrilled that also a displaced scholar from Ukraine was able to join us at the Academy um, of Sciences here in Vienna, Olena, who has been very helpful, of course, on the one hand as a demographer, but also someone who could supply some uh, insights uh, into her uh, country of origin. So that has been very helpful. So let me just give you a brief contextualization. I think most of you know this, that so far, and this, uh, these are numbers from August, and I think now they have again been changed due to the events in the last couple of um, days, unfortunately. So far, UNHCR counted around 7 million refugees from Ukraine across Europe, and of course displaced populations um, who migrated or who fled internally in the country are just as high. So we have a very substantial displaced population. So far, the countries most affected by refugee outflows have been the neighboring countries, Poland, but also in Germany, due to the already existing uh, Ukrainian diaspora there, uh, has accepted many Ukrainian displaced people and the Czech Republic. And the latest numbers for Austria, and this is actually not so easy to come by this number because you have to go through the Ministry of the Interior and then the Statistics Austria. It's, it's also not so easy to really give get an exact um, a data point, an exact number of Ukrainian displaced people in Austria. But so far, we have around 80,000 registered uh, Ukrainians here in Austria, many of whom, or most of them, actually live in Vienna or around Vienna, so the urban area. So the key question really that has been underlying the, the survey and that um, could be seen as the aim of our study is to answer perhaps a very basic question, <laughs> namely who the arriving population actually are. So who are people coming, rather moving away from just counting heads to really look at what's in these heads. Who are these people? What is the educational attainment level? What is the socio-demographic composition? Very basic data that actually in some countries, um, also official statistics bureaus uh, are surveying, uh, but in the German speaking countries, this is mainly left to the academic community. But it is of course key um, on the one hand, I think for academia, um, as I said, very important also because it adds another puzzle piece to this already 
uh, emerging notion of self-selection of uh, refugee populations. But also, I would say it is of key importance to policymakers uh, for determining integration measures, but also return support and so on. So this is really um, where our research is heading towards. And earlier this year, already uh, immediately after the outbreak of the war, really in February and March, first uh, surveys were already conducted. There are uh, surveys that I would describe as mixed methods because they have quantitative and qualitative parts conducted by UNHCR. So there's a very big data set that they published also. It's called Life on Hold. It's uh, freely available also on the internet. Uh, now in the second installment, so the second panel wave has already been conducted. But we also have online surveys, for instance, by our colleague Steffen Pötschke in Germany, who conducted this online survey via Facebook ads. Very interesting. So survey the displaced population from Ukraine uh, via Facebook in Poland and in Germany. And these surveys already gave us a first indication that there might be a very high degree of self-selection involved. Yeah? But um, of course, online surveys have many limitations when it comes to serving and sampling. And also UNR, UNHCR then again um, is not strictly speaking a, an academic survey, but really focused also very much on the needs-based and needs-driven analysis. What we saw with regards to uh, previous displacement um, waves or a previous uh, forced migration to Europe in particular, and here mainly talking about the events of 2015 and 16, is that we see that people with lower formal educational attainment and also lower socioeconomic status tend to either flee internally or stay in the neighboring countries in the region but we see that higher educated refugees with a higher socioeconomic background have the resources, also have the infrastructure, have access to social capital in the countries of destination to flee further distances and to also arrive in this case in middle and western Europe. Um, when we talk about refugees from Syria, Afghanistan and Iraq, another important um, aspect that comes in is of course the costs of forced migration. So back in 2015, uh, we did a similar survey actually among arriving populations from Syria and Afghanistan here in Vienna. And we also asked them about uh, the costs of their journey, for instance, from Damascus to Vienna. And here we found that on average people paid between 2000 to 4000 US dollars. And just to put that into context, this is an average annual income in Syria before the war actually, with the war as we know now, there's heavy inflation. So that means that the de facto um, weight of, of carrying this kind of cost is much higher for a whole family, but even of course for a single person. And this explains some of the dynamics um, behind these forced migration movements that we see. On the one hand, it, it explains why higher educated people with a higher socioeconomic background, higher income are able to travel further distances because they have the money to do so. And of course, needless to say, because we do not have legal um, forced migration ways, and we do not have any resettlement programs, really, this money mostly goes to smugglers, right? So I think it's clear to stay here. Um, so this is one aspect. On the other hand, it also partly explains why in 2015, 16, we saw a very different um, demographic composition of the refugee um, migration. It was mainly young men, uh, which is also heavily politicized, that is mainly young male uh, persons coming to um, Austria, Germany, and so on. Part of the reason for that, another, part is, another reason is the draft, the military draft, and so on, internment, et cetera, et cetera, fleeing from the Assad regime. Um, so similar to some of the aspects you might see in Russia now, but very importantly also, it was the costs involved. Um, and of course the moment, um, because what we found is that um, most young men arriving um, in this first cohort of the 2015 refugees were not single, but the majority of them was married with children. And indeed that was also what many did that the moment they were granted um, asylum in Austria and Germany or neighboring countries, they then had the option of legally reuniting with their family members, with their wife and children, because then you have the legal and formal family reunification programs. And so this is also a cost factor that was involved very much. Um, and that adds to the self-selection 
So what we can also deduce from this is that a, a lack of legal forced migration op options, a lack of resettlement programs, for instance, actually selects refugees economically, which means that the other side of the coin, the poorest of the poor, do not have the option typically to leave the country at all, yeah? stuck in place, or as Sigmund Baumann would say, chained to place. And this is really what we see here. And this is also why I often say, I think it's very fitting that forced migration research is done at, at an economics university, right? Because this is really very much at the core of our current migration and refugee regime, I would say. So this is just to give an overall picture where this is situated with sort of the current state of the art here and what a previous research found, Carlson Williams, Williamson, uh, Williams, for instance, they did a very broad scoping re uh, review of um, several European countries and the refugees who arrived to these countries in 2015 and 2016, and they found this high educational self-selection in almost all the European countries they surveyed. Our study back then focused in particular on Austria, but similar results were found, for instance, also for Germany and so on. So it's really uh, one possible piece after the other that adds to this impression of self-selection. So this is our starting point, really. Um, and this is the second uh, aspect that comes in, and now moving to sort of the methodological aspects is that Quantitative surveys among refugees are, of course, let's say, not an easy task. Um, even, even if you're not surveying refugees in, for instance, refugee camps or in the countries of origin or in, in uh, transit countries, still in Western um, countries of destination, it is rather difficult to do so for several reasons. Um, so on the one hand, displaced populations are described as a rare or hidden group uh, in uh, research and in sampling. They tend to be highly mobile even when they have arrived in the first country of destination. And of course, and this is, I think, most important here, they are vulnerable groups for various reasons. It's a population that fled war and or persecution and that remains vulnerable also um, in the country, uh, in the host country. Uh, what we also see in migration research, and thankfully this is slowly uh, changing and improving, is that very often surveys of refugees or of migrants, or a particular group of migrants, were part of or integrated in general social surveys. So you ask for migration background, migration history, and that's it. But you seldom had like specific, uh, a specific focus on specific groups. Yeah? Slowly, this is changing, thankfully. And of course, research ethics and methodolo methodology are very important to consider when surveying um, a potentially tra traumatized population, a highly vulnerable population. Uh, so what we did, and it's interesting that, again, this has been improving um, in the last couple of years, we also had the questionnaire that we used in the field um, um, critically assessed by the ethics committee at our institution. So this is important. I remember back in 15, when we also tried to get an ethical approval, the committee was rather struck by this request. They said, well, we do that for medical research, but why do you want to do it for sort of sciences? Okay, well, this is your check. <laughs> and now it was much more sort of much stricter and people knew that this is state of the art and it's important to do. So we can also see that within the field, I think, um, Forced migration research is slowly establishing itself as an important area of study, but also with very important parameters that in other disciplines might not that might not might not be that key or central to doing research. And I think that's also an important learning and important development over the last years. So Currently, with regards to the Ukrainian populations, there are several studies that are being planned or implemented in Europe, focusing here mainly on Middle and Western Europe. We have in Germany a rather large scale panel study that is currently going on. So uh, this is a study that already started in 2015, focusing on Syrian and Iraqi refugees. Um, done by the BAMF, EAB, and SERP, and now it focuses on Ukrainian arrivals with a sampling size, intended sampling size of 6,000 refugees. This will be representative, yeah? uh, and they are currently in the field, and first results are expected in early December. Then we have the Austrian Integration Fund, who did a survey on exclusively Ukrainian women here. We have the European Asylum Agency, who did a completely online survey under this link. Um, 
which of course is a bit uh, problematic when we talk about sort of dissemination methods because basically everyone could participate. I mean, I participated in it because I wanted to see what the questionnaire looked like. So of course, this is not the, the most ideal sampling strategy. So let's do it like that. And then we also have a research being done in Ukraine, for instance, about border crossings, so serving immigrants. So um, stunningly, I think to everyone who's not affected directly by the war, research is going on in the country, massively so, and it's really, really inspiring to see that. And then we have the different UNHCR service that I talked about that are also helpful to contextualize our results. So some of the uh, ch challenges and limitations, just very briefly, representativity in Austria, we really do not have a sampling frame because we don't know the basic number of all Ukrainian refugees arriving here. And we don't have any social demographic characteristics of these. So our representativity is not necessarily given. However, I will show you how our sampling fits into the overall demographic distribution of Ukrainians here. So we can assess how close we got to being a represent to having a representative sample. Language and, uh, and cultural aspects are, of course, key, but also sensitive topics related to these experiences of war and displacement. Typically, in refugee service, you do not, in particular, ask about the forced migration route, for instance, or the specific stops that people took, or the specific ways that were used, the specific channels that were used. So there are some sort of uh, red lines that importantly do not tend to be crossed by serious researchers. Then of course, establishing trust is very key for sharing sensitive topics, um, in particular if online surveys are being done. And with regards to online surveys, also another key aspect to consider is data security and dissemination of trust. And this is, uh, becomes more and more important as a lot of research is moving into the online environment. So moving to our survey, we called it Ukraya, which stands for Ukrainian arrivals in Austria. So we use this very neutral term arrivals because we don't know if people you know, will stay with this place, temporary protection regime, whether they will apply for asylum, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a very neutral term. And the key research questions really were, who are the Ukrainian refugees that associate with demographic background, social demographic composition, focusing very much on formal educational attainment, uh, qualifications, and also skills for labor market, but then also importantly, staying and return intentions, um, because this is again, a, a field I think that will be interesting to survey in the months to come. Uh, our survey design, so we used on the one hand, paper and pencil questionnaires that were distributed uh, in the field, but we also had a web component. I will show you some pictures uh, from the field phase in a minute. Our field phase was from early April to June uh, 2020, and the sample size we had were on the one in Austria, in Vienna specifically, we had over a thousand respondents, so quite a large sample for a not so large Ukrainian displaced population in, in Vienna. And in the Polish sample in Krakow, we had 500 respondents. Plus, these were the direct respondents. And they were also asked to give information on their partners and children who were either with them in the host country or were still in Ukraine. And so this means that the, the overall sample size, including proxy um, responses, is that much larger. But I will show you that in a minute. Now we have some pictures. Now it's the picture part, yes. <laughs> so this, these are our paper and pencil questionnaires that we used uh, in Ukrainian. We also had other language options just to test it out. So we had a German version, of course. We had an English version. We also had a Russian version. Not surprisingly at all, mainly only the Ukrainian version was used, of course, and demanded. And the other side, you can see info leaflet that was first distributed, um, yeah. Here you can see some impressions from the field phase in uh, Austria. This is the uh, Austrian uh, Vienna um, Center, the registration center where all Ukrainian arrivals had to register. On the one hand, to get the temporary protection status, uh, the blue card also, what is it was printed, um, and also social security like benefits, food for sovereign and so on. They also had to register for this uh, at this very place. So basically a one-stop shop which made it easier also for us to sample people there and to ask them um, and to just ask them to participate in the survey. Um, and this is here, this is actually my colleague here, Fiona, this is you here. Um, at, at one point you agreed on being included in this yeah, sure. slide, okay? Good. Uh, so what we did is we positioned ourselves uh, right at the entry point, yeah? 
And here you can see a picture from another colleague of ours. Um, so we had Lanyard that clearly differentiated us from the humanitarian organizations there. Um, still, I have to be honest, there was some confusion in this high stakes environment. Um, and uh, we then asked people to participate. And, and of course, very importantly, uh, participation was free. So people did not have to participate in form of consent was very important and so on. However, I think self-critically, and this is also learning that we gained in 2015, we did realize that because when people arrived, on the one hand, there was high compliance with everything that people in the host country ask you to do, right? So you are very much compliant, and when people hand you a form, you basically take it. So this is something that we experienced back in 2015, but also now. And so because there also people there in this waiting area, which you can see, here, if I go back um, in this waiting area here, um, people had to wait sometimes hours on end um, for their appointment there. And so they used the time to not only fill in the form that they needed for the police registration or that they needed to get uh, basic income, but they also filled in our form. So we can't, of course, completely rule out that our form was considered part of the obligatory forms to fill in. Huh? That's, I think, very important uh, when we talk about these such ethics. So, on the other hand, for us, of course, it led to a rather high participation rate now. Huh? And this is sort of um, difficult field to navigate. These are some impressions from the field phase in Krakow, which was a football stadium, so a completely different venue, really. Um, and also similar actually set up, I think, because there was also a waiting area here. Um, and in the uh, Polish sample, this was only done by paper and pencil questionnaire. So they did not have the online option. We did have a web survey, which you can see here. This is what it looks like, the landing page on the phone. We actually, this is an interesting methodological finding, site finding. Um, unintended finding, let's put it like that. We expected people to mainly want it to participate via the web survey, because we thought that when people have to wait for their appointment, they will perhaps also stand in the queue. It will be difficult to write without being able to sit down. Also, you always have your phone with you in this day and age. The Ukrainian population is a highly digitalized population. We knew that. So we thought we need to have a web survey. And then actually this was much below our expectations. So the participation rate for the web survey was much, much lower than in the paper and pencil uh, survey. Um, people readily more or less said that yes, because we handed out individual QR codes. So when they were asked, would you like to have a QR code, an individual one to participate, to scan with your phone, they said yes, yes. But hardly anyone started the survey. And among those who started, a very, very small percentage finished on the phone. Various reasons for that, you know, it might be because you're easily distracted on the phone, uh, you don't want to resume it, um, you think that it's not that binding in nature as a paper and pencil questionnaire, several reasons here, but that's an interesting finding on, you know, how to sample uh, vulnerable populations in such an environment that very much uh, people relied on the uh, paper and pencil questionnaire. So these are our overall topics that we surveyed, and I will present uh, results on almost all of them, not all of them, because this would need several hours, I think, but I will try to focus on the most important results that we gained. So first of you, an overview uh, of the release sample is that we had a bit over 1,000 uh, respondents. Not surprisingly, 89% of them were women, which more or less corresponds to the overall um, gender distribution of the Ukrainian population, of the Ukrainian displaced population in Austria. Almost all people that we surveyed had Ukrainian citizenship. This was mostly due to the fact that third country nationals who perhaps also fled the war and for instance, studied in Ukraine, when they arrived in Austria, first of all, they were told not to go to this registration center. And if they arrived there, we heard of cases being deported immediately. So their passport was seized and they were deported. So of course, when we arrived there to sample the people in this facility, there was hardly anyone who was not a Ukrainian national. Yeah? Uh, respondents were on average 39 uh, years old. Um, one in three were childless, and those who had children, we had on average 1.7 children. And as I already said, nine in 10 participated via the paper and pencil questionnaire. And also the paper and pencil questionnaire was much more often completed than the online version. And also with regards to religious affiliation, I think no real um, surprises here. 
Um, so first of all, and this is already a first puzzle piece that adds to the impression of high self-selection, is that in our um, survey in Austria, we found that while respondents came from almost all regions of Ukraine, it is clear that Kiev city was heavily overrepresented. So 30% or even more than 30% came directly from Kiev, which is different to the Polish sample, where much, a much higher share of the overall uh, sample came from rural areas. Yeah? So this is the first sort of difference between a neighboring country and the country in Western Europe is that people who moved further to the West tended to be more urban um, in general, as a sort of course uh, insight here. What we also see when we look at demographics here is that um, this is now including partners and children in Austria. And we can even go one step further and also including uh, partners who stayed in Ukraine. So this is the other ones in orange. So this means overall we have information on 2,000 and almost 800 persons in the whole sample. Moving a bit quicker here to go directly to this notion of human capital, because this is another aspect that very much plays into the self-selection that we found. We found that um, Ukrainian uh, refugees in Austria are a highly self-selected group in terms of education. Um, and this is now just our sample. Yeah? You can see uh, in the Vienna samples of people who were in Vienna, yeah? people either directly surveyed or proxy information uh, by the partner. We see that um, among women, we have uh, with the master or doctor's degree, so very high for education, 52% with the men actually it was a bit higher, men who arrived in Austria, um, which was of course a much smaller share. But even with the bachelor's degree, uh, we had 23 or 25%. So we have a very, very high share uh, of people with a tertiary education uh, degree. Um, and this is most interesting, I think, if we put it in context with the general population in Ukraine, which is what this slide shows. So what we did here is we only looked at persons aged 25 to 64. Why 25? Because this is the time where presumably you will have finished your university education, so you will already have a degree. Um, and we compared our sample, which is the blue bubbles, uh, with the Ukraine census data, the latest available from the Ukraine census data from uh, 2021. And it is very clear when we only look at the share of people with a tertiary educational degree, that in our sample you have, for all, for both genders, you have 83%, uh, right? Uh, whereas in the Ukrainian general population, you only have 30%. Yeah? And this is the first very clear indicator of the high self selection especially because this result also holds when we do consider a rather high academization uh, in the Ukrainian general population. So we know that in the recent years, especially since Ukraine gained independence, there has been a lot of efforts into also increasing the share of people with an academic education, with an academic degree. So this is always what I get as a first response. Yes, but you can't compare it to, you know, Western European populations because it's different and there might be some um, jobs that in Ukraine require academic um, a degree, but not in Austria, Germany. Yes, but it, this result of self-selection, I think, still holds because it clearly shows that uh, while the general population in Ukraine is well educated, those people uh, who arrived uh, in Austria um, are much more and might have a much higher educational attain attainment. Yeah? And again, it shows that um, we have this. Um, we have this degree of self-selection that's happening here. Um, and uh, later I will also show you a comparison with Poland, where we also see this degree of self-selection, but it's less pronounced. Yeah? So we see different degrees. Um, but now staying with the Austrian sample, the socioeconomic background is also interesting to consider uh, because this adds another layer here. We found that respondents mainly belong to an upper middle class. There are two uh, general questions that are very often used in social uh, science research to determine the socioeconomic background. On the one hand, it's self-assessment. So we ask respondents on a, a five scale, a five part scale, how they would rate or assess their own social class. Yeah, Upper class, upper middle class, lower middle class, working class or lower class. So you can see in the self-assessment about a high percentage 
set up for middle class, yeah? which is not such an intuitive uh, response actually in such an environment where you are being served as a potentially vulnerable population, also in a place and location where you do apply for basic social support because of your experience of displacement and war, right? So it's not an intuitive result and still it's a very high percentage, which I think really goes to show that this is very also perhaps truthful response here. And the second uh, item that is very often used in social science research to assess a respondent's socioeconomic background is home ownership. So the living situation before the war. And it's interesting that um, we see a rather high percentage of uh, refugees in the Austrian sample who either said they owned their own house yeah, with 80% or even more importantly owned their own apartment uh, with 58%. And owning this, owning their own apartment, while this might be much more widespread in Ukraine than, for instance, in Austria, Germany, it's still important because we see a much lower share of people owning an apartment in the Polish sample, which again shows this urban rural divide. Yeah? So owning an apartment would not be something you do in a, in a highly rural area, right? In the provinces, you either live in your own house, in your family's house, and so on. But living in an apartment is a key indicator for a clearly urban population. And so in the, in the Austrian sample, we do have a high share of people who said they owned the, the apartment that they lived in. Um, and again, this is an indicator for a rather interesting degree of self-selection, I would say, especially we, when we compare it to the population in the immediate neighboring countries like Poland. Uh, for employment, um, and again, I think this adds to this picture really is that we have a rather high share of labor market uh, participation. 91% of all respondents and also of their partners said that they had already actively participated in the labor market at some point. So not only high education attainment, but also labor market experience. And specifically before the war, 57% were employed and 25% self-employed. The rate of self-deployment was much higher among men than women, which is also true for Austria and other countries. Um, occupational groups, not surprisingly academic professions, very represented, so 43%. And interesting also, some of the main industries that we found uh, was information and communication technologies. This is also one sector where the Ukrainian diaspora that had already been in Austria before the outbreak of the war was overrepresented. So communication technologies uh, are a sector of the labor market where we do see a sizable Ukrainian um, workforce in Austria, but also in Germany. Uh, financial insurance services, but also education and health social services. And now when it comes to uh, labor market integration efforts, of course, on the one hand, this is much needed workforce. On the other hand, of course, especially education and health are heavily regulated sectors of the Austrian labor market. Yeah? So even if people have these degrees and, and have this experience working there, this might be a long road down the way to get the degrees obtained abroad, recognized for the Austrian system, to get it translated, to have all the necessary additional qualifications. Uh, so the question is also how pragmatic uh, will be the sort of Austrian labor market show itself um, to employ people perhaps before having gone through all the formal recognition process. Um, I already talked about the origin of respondents in the Austrian sample, and on the one hand, we already found that um, this is a, a clearly urban population, but also, interestingly, the uh, allocation, the origin of respondents in our sample very much responds to the regions with the highest GDP per capita. Yeah? So again, another puzzle piece that shows that there's a high selection being involved because clearly Kiev is overrepresented but also with regards to the other uh, provinces and regions, we can see that those regions with the highest GDP per capita were overrepresented among the respondents. And this is the one inside here. And now, interestingly, the comparison, because this, um, I think, is also important as a takeaway. It adds to this general impression of the further refugees move from their home country, the more self selective they tend to be as a general finding. 
Here we now have, remember this fancy bubble chart with another data point, namely uh, people in the Polish sample. So you have on the one hand in the baby blue, you have Ukrainian refugees in Austria. In the dark blue, you have Ukrainian refugees in Poland, Krakow specifically. And in yellow, you have the Ukrainian general population. Yeah? And if you look at all genders, uh, I think it's a very clear picture emerges. You have at the highest sort of education attainment, it is those Ukrainian refugees who came to Austria, where we found that 83% of them have a tertiary degree, bachelor, master's, or doctor's degree. In the Polish sample, Ukrainian refugees who went to Poland, still a certain degree of self-selection, but lower than the one in Austria, with 66% of all refugees having a tertiary uh, educational degree. And in the Ukrainian general population in 2021, we have 30%. Yeah? And so really, I think this picture emerges here that the further refugees move from the home country, the more self-selected they are uh, with regards to education attainment. Um, the same also goes for language skills, um, where again, um, this is now for the Austrian sample, for instance, we found that the language skills were also given us very high. And many people that um, spoke um, at least three languages, if not um, four languages. Um, so again, corresponds to high educational attainment. Um, interestingly, the current living situation, and this is also something that I think is not that intuitive um, at first glance. Here we have a comparison in blue, the Viennese sample and in yellow, the Krakow sample. And in the Viennese sample at the beginning of this year, so in April and May, when the um, focus of our survey was done, we found that a rather high share among those refugees who arrived in Austria lived in the apartment they themselves rented. Yeah? So they had the funds because they had savings, because they also received what I would actually call like reverse remittances, namely from the men who stayed in Ukraine. So several women actually received money from, uh, from home to be able to rent an apartment. And again, I think it is an indicator for the rather high socioeconomic background, which does not mean, of course, that people will not need uh, support uh, further along the line. And when we move into the winter, of course, but in the beginning, it's interesting to see that in the Viennese sample, a very high share of people were able to at least afford this renting an apartment in the first few weeks or months. Yeah? So another indicator for high socioeconomic background. Uh, in the Krakow sample, on the other hand, much more often people were living in someone else's apartment or live with either an Austrian Polish family, which is also represented. This is slowly changing. Yeah? So we now see on the one hand, people running out of funds as one aspect, but also what we see, and this is, I think, a worrying development, that of course, those private citizens, both in Austria and Poland, uh, who were um, able to host a Ukrainian family or Ukrainian refugee, now feel that this is no longer temporary, which I think it was never intended to be, but okay. But of course, they were told it would be temporary. And now we're seeing that with high prices and inflation, both Austrian and Polish families uh, feel increasingly unable to continue hosting. Yeah? And so this means that, of course, mm -hmm. um, Ukrainian refugees also increasingly have to move into shared apartments uh, or find their own apartments on the, on the free housing market. Uh, and this will create uh, also all kinds of issues, I think. Um, but it's the first indicator, really, that at least in the beginning, we did see funds that were available here. Yeah. And the choice of host country is, I think, another very interesting finding, in particular when we look at the reasons for choosing either Vienna as the host city or Krakow as the host city. Yeah? Again, the Viennese sample is in blue and the Krakow sample is in yellow. And what is interesting to see that for Vienna, many people focus on social capital or social networks, uh, or what we also call bridgeheads yeah, in migration research, the community effect. Um, focus on friends or family that they knew that were living here. I think it's also interesting that it's much more with friends rather than family. So not with people related to uh, yourself, but really colleagues, acquaintances, because people, and this is what they said in open text field, we asked them specifically, many said, 
I know someone here, I worked here, I studied here, um, I speak German and uh, among the three German speaking countries, Austria is the best, but this is a result you like to hear. High living quality, uh, I really want my children to have good educational, uh, good education here, or I was a tourist in this country for several times and so on. And I think this is actually a very strong and determined choice of host country, which of course in a forced migration context, we usually do not grant refugees, right? Because we still have this notion of first safe country. And so refugees in particular are not meant to choose the host country. But here we can clearly say that this is an effect that we see, right? Um, and the reasons that were given uh, are more familiar from a regular migration context, an expat uh, context, they are of a highly educated, highly mobile, global cosmopolitan population choosing their next place to live because it has nice opera houses, and I'm paraphrasing, and it has high quality of life. Yeah, And this really, I think, on the one hand, is important for the specific population, again, adding to this picture of an almost international elite also that came, but importantly, also in general for forced migration research, perhaps we need to revise some notions about, you know, choice of host country, what does it mean, and so on. And then, interesting enough, with regards to Poland, there was one reason that was given by the majority of people in the Krakow sample, which was basically geographical proximity, because it's close to home. So here it was not because I know friends, their family, I have good networks, or because high quality of living, it's because it's close to Ukraine, I would like to go back. And we already see this effect with kind of a, I would call it circular forced migration, which again does not exist yet as a concept, but really people crossing the border to Ukraine and back again and so on, like a commuting um, movement actually that is happening, also very interesting from a migration studies perspective, um, that again shows you the intention of why people uh, chose either Poland as a neighboring country or move further to the West for very different. And of course, so sort of the next step, this also affected return intentions, right? Because when you know that you will choose a country based on your social context and so on, you might have lower return intentions than if you want to like, if you want to stay close to Ukraine because you would like to go back to Ukraine. And feeling welcome to this and as a minor result. Um, I wouldn't interpret here too much. In Vienna, people felt less welcome in Krakow, which has to do with proximity, I think. Um, but also it's interesting when you look at, in the next slide, at return intentions of people in Krakow, because people in Krakow felt very welcome and still a higher percentage wants to go back because initially it was their intention from the start. And this is why they ended up in Poland because they wanted to be close to the home country. So return intention, and this is really, I would take this with a grain of salt and many limitations because these were return intentions or staying intentions surveyed in April, May, and June this year. Yeah? So this might have changed a lot. And also we now have the second installment of the uh, UNHCR survey that I mentioned that just came out in September, which already showed that return intentions have changed a lot among displaced populations. And that for the time being, a rather high percentage intends to stay in the particular host country that they ended up in. Yeah. Um, so again, we have this comparison between Vienna and Krakow. And what we see is, I think, a rather differentiated picture. And remember, this was at a time when the overall narrative on sort of the EU level was they all want to go back and they all will go back. Yeah. And this was also what I think was very much the narrative that was fed to the private citizens opening their homes. That is very, very temporary. But already back then, as we can see here, a rather differentiated picture emerges that I think is very realistic and really goes to show that the people who were displaced knew very well what was coming and how to assess the situation. Yeah? So we do have a size percentage with 34 or 35% in Vienna and Krakow who said, I want to return as soon as the war ends. Um, but then again, also we have about a quarter who already back then said I may return. So it's not clear, I may, but I also may not. Um, and interestingly, um, in the Polish sample, and this is not so surprising, a higher percentage said I may, may return even if the war continues, which we're seeing now with the border crossings and so on. But in the Venice sample, on the other hand, already a quarter of the sample population said 
I do not know. Yeah, much higher than in Krakow. And this has to do with why they chose uh, Austria in the first place. Yeah. And the reverse of the medal really is thanks to stay in Austria. So again, if you need some with a much higher percentage, not surprisingly, I think said, I would like to stay in Austria. I will neither travel on nor will I go back for the time being. That is. Whereas in the car cost sample, a higher percentage said no, I will not stay. Yeah? And so again, the further people move from the home country, the less pronounced the return intentions are for the time being. This might change very much, uh, but again, it adds to this picture. So as a summary, now I'm moving to the end of my talk here. Uh, this is, uh, I would say, because now we really have the puzzle pieces that I kept talking about, right? So this is really uh, this image that emerges of Ukrainian refugees in Austria self-selection in the key dimensions of the labor market, um, just some um, uh, aspect that I picked here, previous employment, academic professionals, also which sectors of the labor market are overrepresented, uh, socioeconomic background or financial resources, property ownership is very pronounced, financial means in Vienna, and we also have that, I didn't show you this, but a very high percentage that they did have costs of forced migration because, for instance, they had to rent their own car and so on, uh, to make it out very, very fast. Um, then education, also very highly um, re represented in the sample. And of course, also social capital as another important dimension, I would say, where 42% uh, said that they have networks of friends or they can family friends. Yeah. So, what does this mean? And of course, this is work in progress now because now it's about sort of, uh, the interpretation of our results. Uh, what I would postulate now is one of our hypotheses that can be deduced from this data is that we see that Ukrainian displaced population in Austria and to a lesser degree in Poland, they are a highly self-selected, usually urban middle class, in Poland much more rural middle class and sort of a bit lower socioeconomic background. We also see that the further refugees moved from Ukraine, the higher the socioeconomic status and educational attainment, but at the same time, the less pronounced the return. Then active choice of the host country is something that I would say is sort of unique to this particular uh, wave of displacement to the Ukrainian context really. Also because remember for many other uh, previous um, refugee waves arriving in Austria, Germany, what we know is that they did not have legal ways of arriving here. So of course that particular choice element was much less pronounced. Yeah? This is one, one reason for that. On the other hand, what we do see also in other refugee population is this dependence on financial resources, but also social resources and so capital uh, that really adds evidence, I think, that also in forced migration, not only in regular migration, we do see a certain level of self-selection, in some cases, a high degree of self-selection into Europe. Yeah? And then, of course, a policy takeaway, which is important because we have sort of funds and, and funders uh, uh, to satisfy, is that I think you can't really apply one integration or return support scheme in all host countries. So we really need to adapt these specific measures that are being implemented to the socio-demographic composition and also the intentions of the refugee population in the respective countries. Yeah. And we'll see how that will go in the upcoming months, I would say. So with this, um, I thank you very much for your attention. You can find first results that we published in English and German at the uh, London School of Economics blog and in the German book questions blog. And then we have a very extensive website, again, thanks to Bernhard, uh, who put all the presentations so far on there, all the material that's available on the survey if you're interested in reading up on that.